Okay. So, welcome everybody. Sorry, I still got charming jazz music playing in my ear. Um, so, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining the session. You've got two excellent speakers and me. Uh, I am slightly jet lagged and uh, I am giving the first talk. So, um, we'll see how it all goes. But uh, my co speakers are instructed to take me off the stage and sit me down in the corner if I start saying anything too crazy. So, um, the subject of uh, our session this afternoon is on post-operative pulmonary complications. We're going to explore some of the epidemiology and the definitions of, of post-operative pulmonary, pulmonary complications, talk a bit about lung protection strategies, and then um, we're going to finish off with uh, what outcomes data we currently have. I think it's a really interesting session, a really, really topical issue, lots of new research in this field, so I hope you enjoy it. If you could uh, bring up the first slide set, please. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about primary complications. Um, the title of the talk was on um, composites and definitions, which is not the most exciting topic to talk about in the world. So I'm going to also add in a little bit of background and epidemiology as well, uh, um, so it's not too completely dry. I do have some disclosures that I've listed here. So um, Primary complications after surgery are, uh, I think the key thing to understand here is you're talking about a lot of different biology all at once. So the most common and the most uh, impactful uh, uh, complication is atelectasis, it's also the most mild. But that, that simple factor that you're getting uh, alveolar collapse at, uh, at scale is probably the, the, the thing that does the most damage because it's the most frequent. Pretty much all patients experience an element of atelectasis after general anesthetic. And we can talk about the various additional factors such as abdominal surgery and so on uh, that make the atelectasis more severe. That in itself can lead to pulmonary collapse. Um, some patients, as a result of that, as well as other biological factors, may experience pneumonia. There are various causes of respiratory failure after surgery, both uh, pulmonary and extrapulmonary. And a lot of patients may develop acute lung injury. But within all of that, there's a, a lot of different types of biology. You can add in problems such as pneumothoraces, maybe aspiration pneumonia, and so on all of which have uh, a, a different basis for the way they happen. And that's really important, first of all, because if you're studying new treatments, uh, you are also using various tools to measure them. And it's quite important that, that your outcome measure is properly uh, calibrated towards the, the treatments that you're using. And that, that the treatment has a, a, a meaningful chance of impacting a measure of success in that outcome measure. And like so many things in perioperative medicine, there's always a risk that we might prove something useful doesn't work through failure to design the clinical trials in the right way. Um, so a bit of background. Uh, chronic lung disease is, is, a, is a very common problem. These are data from worldwide from the International Surgical Outcomes Study. Uh, one in 10 patients having inpatient surgery have chronic lung disease. And they account for one in five of patients who die. So we know that this is, a, 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 in general, an important topic. We know that uh, uh, one in 60 patients develop pneumonia after surgery. Now, that may not sound very much until you visualize yourself as that particular patient. And actually, one in 60 suddenly seems like a lot more than it might do to us as anesthetists. And one in 12 patients who have pneumonia will die. So that's actually a very high mortality rate for pneumonia. Uh, uh, Perioperative pneumonia has a much higher mortality rate than pneumonia per se. Um, and, of course, we know that uh, uh, anybody who has short-term complication has a massively reduced long-term survival after surgery. And, and you can see these original data from the Curie paper in 2005, but which have been repeated, show that the survival, even after adjusting for a bunch of other risk factors, show that uh, any type of post-operative complication, but in particular pulmonary complications, are associated with a very substantial reduction in long-term survival. And this is the bit where I remind everyone that patients have surgery for one of two reasons. They either want to improve their quality of life or they want to improve their quantity of life or both. So when surgery impacts negatively on quality or quantity of life, not only is it harming the patient, but it's completely counteracting any benefit that surgery may have for that patient. And that's why these issues are so important, that, that they're expecting a net benefit, not a net harm. And, and it's our job, really, to make sure those things don't happen. 
So why do patients have these respiratory problems after surgery? Well, I can't really tell you anything you don't know here. We know that patients with chronic lung disease as a basis are going to be more at risk. I think that's fairly intuitive. We know that general anesthesia in particular, but even regional anesthesia of various types, um, makes you more at risk of pulmonary complications for various reasons. Atelectasis is, is a big one. And that interacts with various other things, muscle relaxation, uh, abdominal surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and so on. But um, we also know that uh, there are other ways in which anesthesia can put you at risk of pulmonary complications. Aspiration could be one example, maybe pneumothoraces related to anesthetic procedures and so on. So again, it's not completely simple, and we have to bear that in mind. Muscle relaxation is, is an important one. And uh, there's a lot of interest in how we tackle the adverse effects of uh, neuromuscular blockers at the moment. Uh, there's a couple of uh, major trials going on internationally looking at, for example, Shugamadex. There's also a lot of interest in how we measure neuromuscular blockade and whether we're doing that as well as we possibly can. A lot of people feel that we could do that better and maybe that would uh, avert a lot of problems too. So things like body position, surgical manipulation, the inflammatory response to surgery causes uh, 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 um, an organ damage to the kidneys, to the liver, to the heart, to the brain, and also to the lungs. Um, pain in itself, as you know, and immobility. And also, don't forget that there's a lot of things that we do, method of ventilation, something you're going to hear about in a little moment, but there's a lot of things that we do and we can adjust that makes those complications and those processes more or less likely to happen. And it's understanding how in each individual patient we can make the right choices to do that. Now, one of the topic title I was given, uh, didn't choose, but was given, was about composite outcome measures to, to measure post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, one of the challenges we have as clinical trialists is designing a clinical trial that's realistic to recruit. Uh, and some of the events that we're trying to prevent are relatively unusual, and we can't prevent all of them. We can only present some of them. So that can lead to trials which have several thousand patients needed to achieve the statistical power we want. That leads us to become very tempted to define different outcome measures where the events are much more common and might have a better chance of being altered by our treatment under test. And that leads to the use of composite outcome measures. And post-operative primary complications is one of the widest and most important use uh, uh, composite outcome measures in perioperative medicine. Um, really, there's only one pro, and that's what the term statistical efficiency. I think that's a, a kind term. Uh, uh, rigging the numbers in our favor uh, is probably fairer. The, um, uh, the, the sample size calculations are always a dark art. Uh, and we all, as trialists, tend to think about the number of patients we can realistically recruit that we think are generalizable and then work out what we can buy with that uh, sample size, what, what type of treatment uh, uh, effect can we identify and what type of outcome measures could we use. And that's pretty much always been the way and it probably always will. But it's important to be open about how that happens. And that's what leads us to be tempted to use composite outcome measures. But they've got many downsides. Um, they measure very different biology. And the post-operative pulmonary complications that, that will combine pneumonia and atelectasis and ARDS, for example, may, our intervention may impact on all of those individual bits of biology. Or maybe it only interacts on some of them and not others. And if we're trying to prevent ARDS, uh, but the majority of our events arise in our composite due to atelectasis, then we may have no chance of proving our treatment does or doesn't work, and it may have been the wrong choice. And, and, and understanding these things is quite important. You have to remember that composites are often dominated by a single outcome within them, and certainly atelectasis is much more frequent than the other comp uh, components of most composites we use for PPCs. Um, and also, it can be hard once you've done your trial and you've found a significant reduction in pulmonary complications to know exactly how our treatment worked. Where was the benefit? Where did it actually sit? What good have we done? And if you want to go off and do a bigger trial, what outcome measure should we choose then? And we're not always sure. So there's some risks to using them, but, but I think they're sort of widely agreed by most of us that, that they're necess necessary. 
and I'll quote Marcus Schultz, who does a lot of uh, postdoctoral primary complication research, is that death is the ultimate composite outcome measure. And I think that's a very fair comment that, that we often measure mortality and consider that to be the prime and most robust uh, uh, clinical outcome measure that we might measure. But actually, death itself is a composite of every biological process you can think of. So it's not necessarily as simple as, as picking something that's just less common. Uh, it, it can be a little bit more complex than that. So we're in the happy position uh, in peroptive medicine of having a really strong academic community worldwide. Um, and uh, a good few years ago now, uh, two groups independently put together a plan to develop uh, uh, standardized outcome measures for perioptive medicine research in a, in a range of different domains. One was the uh, step group led by Paul Miles and, and team that, that was uh, driven out of the Australasian group, and the other was the compact group led by um, Mike Grocott and colleagues. And those two groups got together and, and generated a worldwide program of um, uh, consensus definitions that we now use across the board for perioptive medicine research. And this is the one for postdoctoral primary complication uh, and has basically reinvented what, what the um, definition should be to make sure that they fit, but they still got the sort of advisory warnings on them. And th effectively, uh, these are the sort of four key components of the step compact definition for postoperative primary complications. Uh, atelectasis, demonstrated by CT or by chest radiograph pneumonia using the US CDC criteria. ARDS using the Berlin definition and pulmonary aspiration. Um, provided you've got both the clinical history and the radiological evidence, there's a real concern about overdiagnosis of pulmonary aspiration. However, um, we did also strongly emphasize grading on severity of the complications themselves. Um, and a lot of the arbitrariness in measuring these complications is not uh, um, about the most severe cases. It's often whether something is there or, or present in a very, very mild form or not present. And it can be quite difficult to distinguish in across the board very mild complications after surgery from just the normal biology that happens after surgery. So if you look at a surgical site infection, for example, a superficial surgical site infection, distinguishing that from just a bit of redness and erythema around the wound can be very, very difficult to do. When does atelectasis become an actual complication? That's a quite a subjective judgment to make. And so grading on severity can be quite an important way of, of eliminate, eliminating the subjectivity around that. And remembering that we excluded from the definition a whole range of factors that have a different biological mechanism and then probably should be examined and studied separately. And those are PE, pleural effusions, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, and bronchospasm. So can we prevent primary complications? I'm not going to go into any detail on this, but just to say that, that there's a, a, a lot of candidates out there. There's, there's various uh, uh, interventions where there's good, good evidence of benefit now, of lung protective ventilation, of epidural analgesia. We can debate the, the, the strength of that evidence, but, but there's, there's evidence of benefit of those kinds of interventions. No evidence of benefit in around things like post-operative CPAP as a routine treatment for all patients of post-operative high flow nasal oxygen and so on. And that's got a lot to do with just the blanket use of the intervention rather than picking somebody who's already in respiratory failure and offering it to them. It's about preventive use rather than treatment. And then finally, areas where we could see that there will be helpfully more evidence needed, you know, smoking cessation, respiratory physiotherapy and so on. So there's a lot of interest in a lot of different, very varied types of research in peroptive medicine to help prevent pulmonary complications. This is um, one initiative that, that I'm involved in and, and many around the world are, which is a global health trial looking at uh, high versus low inspired oxygen concentrations and chlorhexidine mouthwash uh, to prevent aspiration pneumonia uh, in a big two by two trial. This is a big ongoing trial. It's just one example of many of the types of things that we're doing now that will generate a very definitive evidence base that we will help, that we hope very much will define the care that you provide. So um, w without uh, much further ado, I'll, I'll stop there and, and invite uh, the next speaker to the stage. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Moon. I'm from Duke University, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, ventilation strategies. Does low tidal volume really matter? Um, I have a couple of conflicts, neither one of which has anything to do with this talk. So um, when I started in this business, there was mostly discussion about pressure, uh, inspired pressure, and how high should you make it. And um, this study in Rabbits, published in 1989, uh, demonstrated that uh, peak inspiratory pressure was certainly related to the outcome here, which was uh, capillary filtration coefficient, leakage of, um, of fluid from capillaries. But if you put a a body cast on, uh, there was no effect. And essentially what this demonstrated was that the important parameter was not pressure per se, but rather tidal volume. And, and of course, this study, which I'm sure everybody in this room has, has seen, uh, the ARDSNET uh, publication in, in 2000, looking at low tidal volumes versus high tidal volumes in ARDS, showing that the uh, uh, lower tidal volumes resulted in uh, reduced mortality uh, was because, of course, in ARDS, you have large volumes of lung taken over by fluid, by exudate, and resulting in, in a much smaller lung, in other words, so-called the, the, the baby lung, and for which, of course, lower tidal volume is appropriate and using uh, original tidal volumes, uh, which, uh, again, when I started were, were uh, 15 mLs per kilo uh, would clearly result in pulmonary baritrauma. And, um, and obviously, this is, this is fairly uh, easy to understand. If, you, if you're blowing up a balloon with a bicycle pump, uh, once the balloon reaches a, a critical volume, it ruptures. On the other hand, if you try and inflate a tennis ball, uh, you can apply huge pressures, but nothing really happens. And, and of course, it's usually the volume uh, rather than the pressure, per se. And um, th there are now several uh, so-called types of lung trauma. One is volutrauma, which is basically giving high tidal volumes and causing stretch and, and possibly rupture. Uh, there's atelectotrauma, which is really the interface of collapsed areas of lung with inflated areas of lung, and, and the stress between those two areas uh, causes uh, tissue injury. Now, the question is, um, does this apply to uh, general anesthesia in patients, most of whom have relatively normal lungs to start with? And um, uh, several studies now have shown, uh, as Dr. Uh, Pierce just uh, mentioned, that uh, atelectasis is almost universal in general anesthesia. So does this principle apply to uh, the uh, slightly lower lung volume that, that occurs as, as a result of minor atelectasis. And um, this uh, study by Foutier in 2013 uh, supposedly settled the argument. So this is a, a group of individuals 40 years of age or older scheduled for um, abdominal surgery, either laparoscopic or, uh, or open. Uh, lasting longer than two hours uh, with a, a pre-op pulmonary risk index greater than two. Uh, the details of that uh, really don't matter. Um, and what they did was they, they had uh, two groups. The non-protective ventilation was tidal volume of 10 to 12 mLs per kilo of, of predicted body weight, uh, no PEEP, no recruitment maneuvers. And the other group, the, the lung protective ventilation, was a tidal volume of 6 to 8 mLs per kilo. Uh, with PEEP of 6 to 8 and recruitment maneuvers every 30 minutes. Um, and uh, the recruitment maneuver was nothing special, uh, CPAP of 30 centimeters of water for 30 seconds. And um, what they found uh, was indeed that protective ventilation uh, was, uh, uh, was helpful. So in other words, um, the probability of an event, which was uh, uh, defined, it was a uh, a, a combined uh, group of, of, uh, of uh, 
post-op uh, lung uh, parameters was less with protective ventilation. And so this supposedly settled the argument. Um, however, uh, since that time, um, others have criticized that, that, that study because uh, one group used lower tidal volumes, um, but the other group didn't have any PEEP. And so this study uh, where they looked at uh, individualized PEEP after lung recruitment maneuver plus individualized post-op CPAP, uh, standard uh, interop ventilation plus post-operative CPAP, uh, there were four groups, and standard interop ventilation plus standard post-op oxygen therapy. So these four groups were compared in terms of outcomes, and there was no difference. So what's the difference here between this study and the previous one is, is arguably the PEEP. Um, this study published in, in 2020 uh, looked at uh, non-cardiac surgery, non-intracranial surgery, again, two hours or more, uh, a large study, 1,236 patients, where they compared 6 ml per kilo versus 10 ml per kilo, but all patients got PEEP. The primary outcome was the composite outcome of the standard things, pneumonia, bronchospasm, atelectasis, pulmonary congestion, respiratory failure, pleural effusion, and so on. And they found absolutely no difference between these, uh, the, these two uh, 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 interventions. Um, now, recently, the same group looked at a post hoc analysis of those undergoing laparoscopic surgery only. Uh, there were 325 patients in that group, same primary outcome, and uh, what they found was uh, a slight difference in, in post-operative pulmonary complications within seven days. So um, arguably, uh, since this was a post hoc analysis, uh, it need, would need to be repeated with uh, prospective um, randomization. Now, finally, Bringing up the, the concept of mechanical power, which is the in parameter now, and mechanical power is really the rate at which uh, work is being done on the lung. So it includes tidal volume, respiratory rate, uh, pressures, and PEEP. Uh, this actually is a is a, is a um, approximation of mechanical power. If you really want mechanical power, you have to integrate uh, pressure and uh, volume and and time. And um, mechanical power is relate, has been related to postoperative pulmonary complications in, in several studies. This one in particular recently published, and um, this is a, another study published uh, just very recently. And uh, without um, going into detail, you can see that there's a very slight but statistically significant relationship uh, between <coughs> uh, these uh, various parameters, including uh, mechanical power and post-operative pulmonary complications. Now, you can argue that this makes sense because if you're trying to injure something, an organ, for example, the, the faster you hit it, the faster you injure it, the more likely it is you're going to see a complication. And um, this, obviously, uh, if you're trying to uh, negotiate the uh, destruction of a wall, if you hit it much more quickly, uh, it's going to fall down more effectively uh, than if you're uh, going at it more slowly. And therefore, um, arguably, since there are no studies at y at, as yet uh, uh, randomizing mechanical power, arguably, you can just decrease the respiratory rate on your ventilator and get reduced mechanical power. And there are a couple of studies actually looking at um, a possible outcome here, which is higher end tidal PCO2. If you're going to reduce respiratory rate, PCO2 is going to be higher. Uh, we all kind of set the ventilator according to, you know, like an end tidal of 35 to 40 milliliters of mercury. But what if it's higher than that? And the first study on the left, published in 1968, uh, compared very low PCO2s between 14 and, and 25 and higher PCO2s, so 25 to 38. And they looked at uh, the reaction time to a, uh, to a light flash. So they, they tested people uh, 
they showed them a, a, a light flash and they had to push a button as, as, as fast as they could. And you can see there's a relationship here that uh, higher PCO2, not high PCO2, but higher than lower, uh, resulted in, uh, in, in, more, in better outcomes. On the right is a more recent study published about 10 years ago, uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy, and they randomized these patients to, to getting uh, PCO2s um, low, uh, 21 to 23, medium, 37 to 39, and, and higher, 43 to 45. And they looked at um, the rate at which they uh, returned to spontaneous ventilation. And not surprisingly, those who had a higher PCO2 started breathing more quickly. But they also found that nausea and vomiting were less in the group that had higher PCO2s. So um, what to make of all of this? And that is there's some very nice international consensus statements published uh, just four years ago. And uh, I, I totally support these. Ventilators should initially be set to deliver 6 to 8 mLs per kilo of predicted body weight, PEEP of 5 centimeters of water, uh, zero end expiratory pressure is not recommended. Appropriate PEEP and recruitment maneuvers may improve intraoperative respiratory function and prevent post-op pulmonary complications. And the outcome here, or the immediate outcome, of course, is, is pulse oximetry. If your oxygen saturation starts to go down, a recruitment maneuver, maybe increasing the PEEP, is a simple thing to do. And before induction of anesthesia, position the patient elevated 30 degrees in beach chair position, avoid flat supine position, and, and if not contraindicated, before loss of spontaneous ventilation, use uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or, or CPAP to attenuate anesthesia-induced respiratory changes. So finally, um, I think these standard recommendations are sufficient. Uh, I don't think we're going to get much more out of the literature or, or experiments. However, the role of mechanical power is still uncertain. And to minimize mechanical power, you can very simply reduce respiratory rate, which may have secondary benefits. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for the introduction to the session and the uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm the, the final speaker in this session. I'm going to uh, open with a few words about the nature and relevance uh, and frequency of pulmonary complications and then hopefully jog through a variety of interventions, um, some of which have been alluded to already. Um, maybe highlighting the fact that some of the things that I think we already know work might not actually have a substantive evidence base, and some of the things that we're more skeptical about might actually have more evidence supporting them, um, which hopefully will not leave you more confused at the end of the talk than at the beginning, but at least it'll give you uh, a better flavor of what the evidence looks like. So I have a handful of disclosures, uh, and I don't think any of them are directly relevant uh, to the content of this talk. And I'd like to start with this notion that peripheral uh, pulmonary complications are, are common, and I'm Basing this, uh, th there's lots of epidemiological data, but I'm basing it particularly on the post-operative morbidity survey, uh, which many of you will be familiar with, which has a criterion for pulmonary complications of, of use of supplemental oxygen where someone wasn't on it before, uh, or, or, or some other sort of respiratory support, so NIV or invasive ventilation, but all, all those folk will, will also fall under the basket of having supplemental oxygen. And you can see the uh, frequency here of individuals three days, five days, seven or eight days, depending on the literature, and 15 days after surgery. And either we are, and, and this is in tens of thousands of patients across multiple studies, so either we're unnecessarily administering supplemental oxygen to these patients following surgery, or there's something that's not quite right about the lungs that was fine beforehand and takes a period of time to recover, because almost all of them will leave hospital and go home without additional oxygen. And you can see that between... 20 and more than 35% of patients on day three will be receiving oxygen. At day five, it's uh, somewhere between 6 and 12%. And even out at day 7, 8, 15, there's still a significant number of patients having uh, oxygen, which suggests they've got some kind of post-operative pulmonary complication. It's not differentiating between pneumonia or aphylaxis or 
pneumothorax or any of the other possibilities, but uh, if this were a biomarker, which I suggest to you it's arguable it could be, as I say, either we're giving much too much oxygen or there's a significant amount of morbidity going on. And I don't think we should be surprised. Uh, much of what we do uh, around the time of surgery is profoundly non-physiological. So we mess with the lungs a lot. We typically institute or often institute positive pressure ventilation, which is non-physiological. None of us in this room at the moment are ventilating with positive pressure. We naturally ventilate with negative pressure, and the cardiorespiratory system is set up uh, to deal with that. So there are adverse consequences, both respiratory and hemodynamic, of positive pressure ventilation. We typically give a hyperoxic gas mixture, and I say that because all the epidemiological studies that I've seen suggest that 50% FI2 is, is about the normal. So there are people who religiously stick to the lowest amount of oxygen possible for mental with normal saturations. There are some that are enthusiasts for 80%, but when you look at the observational studies of what most people actually do, it's typically somewhere around 50%, which typically results in a superphysiological uh, PAO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, uh, and is not normal. And we inter instrument the airway and therefore disrupt all the defense mechanisms that typically prevent us getting respiratory problems from day to day. And on top of that, there, there is a systemic inflammatory response, which may be very modest for uh, peripheral surgery, uh, somewhat more substantial for intracavity surgery, and really quite pronounced for intracavity surgery, where we're starting to instrument our open or anastomose the bowel. And I suggest to you that, that pulmonary complications are something of a Cinderella complications. There's not many of the many, many studies that we have in the literature that are specifically focused on pulmonary complications. Lots of them measure them in passing, they are bystanders, if you like, but not ma many are primarily about pulmonary complications. We don't have a troponin for the lungs. And uh, cardiac complications, that it's easy, well, however you interpret a troponin postoperatively, it, it's easy to, to find a number, have a biomarker, and, and we now have a syndrome related to troponin. We don't have the, the, the degree of guideline enthusiasm in the respiratory domain that we have to an almost extraordinary degree, degree internationally in the cardiac domain. And, and by the way, in parenthesis, we don't have chargeable procedures particularly that are relevant, such as uh, coronary catheterization. So the helicopter view of, of the studies I'm going to romp through in a moment uh, are there's, there's lots and lots of, lots of data from a whole variety of different contexts, uh, often bundled interventions, so interventions as part of something like enhanced recovery or prehabilitation, sometimes unbundled. And the outcome is occasionally the focus, but often a bystander outcome for a study which is maybe focused on mortality or, or, or something else. I think long-term conditions are very relevant. Rupert's touched on this uh, already, and I'm not going to explore in any more detail, although, although there is some data about the literature around optimizing chronic respiratory conditions, including uh, COPD, asthma, uh, and fibrotic disease. So this is the, the map, if you like, for the remainder of the talk. I'm going to focus in a classical way that we do on preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative interventions, uh, and going to touch on both specific and general interventions. And uh, the ones with asterisks are ones that are the bundles. So there's a number of interventions that appear to be uh, effective, but it's somewhat difficult to understand which of the particular components of the intervention is working. So pre-op ought to be relatively straightforward. There's lots of things in literature. Uh, stop poisoning patients, so encourage them to stop smoking. Uh, incentive spirometry, inspiratory muscle, muscle training, physiotherapy, and then uh, the bundled interventions, ICOF, which is um, uh, intervention led out of Manchester in the UK, and, and a variety of prehab studies. I think we all know that stopping smoking is good for you and prevents postoperative uh, pulmonary complications, but it's almost impossible to find any literature to support that. So it's not that I don't think it's true. Uh, there's lots and lots of information that smoking cessation is possible. If you use more intensive interventions, it's more likely to be successful. If you use briefer interventions, it's less likely. Uh, there's much less information about the clinical consequences of inter intervening with a smoking cessation program. There's lots of information about observational studies suggesting that uh, if you smoke, terrible surprise, you have many more pulmonary complications. But the interventional studies are few and far between, uh, and really based on the best data I could find, including the Cochrane Systematic Review, there are two studies uh, with only about just over 200 patients for intensive interventions that suggest that probably there's reduction in complications uh, and brief interventions appear not to work. 
But I, I find it extraordinary that such a, we know this is true, and yet there's very, very little data out there on this issue. It is, however, low cost. It has a general long-term health benefit. There's no evidence of harm, and I think it's also unlikely to be harmful. And the, uh, the old mythology about don't let them stop, stop smoking just before surgery because it will make everything worse, there's also no evidence for that as well. So the, uh, the graphic at the bottom is stopping uh, immediately before surgery or uh, four, uh, more than four weeks or more than eight weeks. And uh, although the effect is less pronounced in terms of success, there's no evidence of, of harm. So we move on to breathing interventions, uh, so incentive spirometry and inspiratory muscle training, which are quite different. I'll explain why in a moment. And then physiotherapy, and particularly the active cycle of breathing, and then some of the multimodal interventions. So incentive spirometry as an isolated intervention, based on, uh, I can't count to that many, but that, that many systematic review in, reviews, appears to be ineffective. So there is one, there's one in there somewhere, that suggests that it might, oh, there we go, that down at the bottom, 2023, that it might be effective, but it, it selects a very small number of studies, so it finds about a tenth of the studies of, of similar contemporaneous reviews. So one a little bit nervous of uh, selective reporting. So I don't think incentive spirometry works as an isolated intervention. And the best you can see about uh, inspiratory muscle training across relatively few studies is that it does appear to work. Uh, we had an uh, inspiratory muscle training RCT in the UK, but unfortunately got um, discontinued due to COVID. So, so I think this is, is not a confidently answered question, but the evidence that there is suggests that inspiratory muscle training does work. Incentive spirometry does not. And the limited evidence for physiotherapy is, is reasonably compelling, particularly the, um, the LIPSMAC POP study um, led by Anki Bowden, particularly focused on the active cycle of breathing, but also talking about regularly mobilizing. Um, and, and she showed a very convincing, quite dramatic reduction uh, in uh, post-operative pulmonary complications. So physiotherapists, I think, are reassured. Uh, they, the data suggested that the more experienced physiotherapists were better at the intervention. Um, Conversely, it may be possible that non-physiotherapists may be able to institute this intervention, and certainly within our surgery school and, and others in the UK, that's, where, that's how it's um, uh, delivered. This is the, the, um, the ICOF study, which is a, a complex intervention by the Manchester team in the UK involving uh, an ERAS-type in intervention plus some um, respiratory muscle uh, interventions, of which incentive spirometry is one. Uh, and they showed, not in a randomized control trial, but in a, um, in a time series study uh, where you can see in the smaller box to the right there, increasing compliance over time and decreasing pulmonary complications over time. So in a, in a service implementation setting, they show reasonably convincing benefit using this composite approach. Prehabilitation, I'm sure we'll hear lots of uh, in other parts of the meeting. So the use of uh, exercise, nutrition, and psychological interventions, typically with behavior change support, uh, sometimes with alcohol and uh, uh, smoking cessation added. Uh, and the data is relatively slight. This is um, uh, senior author is Maria uh, Pipoletti from Bristol, which is in preparation for a big grant in the UK. They, they thought across the four studies they identified, there was a convincing reduction from exercise-based rehabilitation in pulmonary compl uh, complications. And if you just lump together the two most recent big studies, uh, th there's, there's no statistical result here, but there is. there looks like a, something like a halving of respiratory complications consistent with almost all the other complications, which look like they're halved as well. If we focus on intraoperative interventions, so particularly ventilation, which I won't talk about, uh, which is uh, dealt with very, um, very well, oxygen, hemodynamic interventions, and neuromuscular blockade, um, I think... Uh, I'm fascinated by oxygen as an intervention, but I think the jury's still out in terms of whether hyperoxia is beneficial, uh, it, sorry, is harmful. I know the uh, WHO recommendations suggest that it reduces um, surgical site infections, but across multiple systematic reviews, that does not seem to be a consistent signal, uh, and there, is, there are some signals of harm. So I think that's uncertain. This, I know, will, will land a little bit controversially, but if you, if you look at the data, uh, goal-directed hemodynamic therapy appears to reduce post-operative pulmonary complications. This is from the original Cochrane review back in 2013. And this was a specifically focused uh, review in 2021, uh, led by one of uh, Dushan, um, Ahaland and Dushyankaran in our group, 
which showed a reduction in postdoctoral pulmonary complications across uh, nearly 10,000 patients. There is some evidence that neuromuscular blockade reduces, uh, so reversal of neuromuscular blockade, particularly with Sugamidex, uh, reduces complications. The evidence is in systematic reviews. There are relatively few studies. They're relatively small studies, and they're in general commercially supported. So I leave you to make your own view about that. And in the post-operative space, um, the three things I will focus on are enhanced recovery. I'm not going to show you any data, but there is uh, across a number of enhanced recovery studies, there's data suggesting that both overall complications and pulmonary complications are reduced. I think the balance of the evidence uh, is that pulmonary complications are reduced with epidural analgesia or anesthesia, although uh, one of the recent Cochrane reviews suggests there's insufficient data, so the one that's focused exclusively on cardiac, the one that's focused on major surgery suggests there is a reduction in postoperative pulmonary complications. Uh, sadly, postoperative CPAP was not effective. I, I don't want to open old scars for, for Rupert, but uh, the PRISM trial looking at um, mortality, reintubation, and pneumonia at 30 days as a composite uh, in nearly 5,000 patients showed really no difference, and we'll maybe come back in the questions as to why that might have been. And there's, there's not really a convincing signal about high-flow nasal oxygen, although there have been a number of studies in the, the recent past. So uh, that was a bit of a, a, a romp through. Uh, I think post-operative pulmonary complications are underappreciated and important. Uh, there's a number of reasons which I've touched on why they might be held back, and, and you can see there listed the, the, comp the uh, interventions that are probably beneficial. Thank you very much for listening. Mike, thank you very much. Um, so we were going to have questions at the end of each talk, but partly because they haven't appeared in the online system until now, uh, um, uh, we're going to sort of move to a panel session. So uh, Richard, Mike, thank you very much um, for two uh, fantastic talks. Uh, there's one question which I think is directed at my talk, which I'll quickly cover, which is, are there any common criteria for diagnosing postoperative pneumonia? Um, we widely use the United States Center for Disease Control criteria for infections. Most groups use them now as the, as the, the generally accepted uh, um, definition. It has to be modified for perioperative care. Um, as a lot of the other definitions need to be modified for perioperative care, but that, that's the one that's recommended in the guidance. It can be modified for specific circumstances. So. Um, the next question is for Dr. Moon. Um, we've got a colleague who's a neuroanesthetist uh, is um, interested in any suggestions of what you would do uh, instead of PiCO2 rising uh, for neuro patients where you don't want a high CO2. I assume the question relates to mechanical power, and I would say that the evidence that me mechanical power is an independent risk factor is, is uh, I, I would say, fairly slim, that there's, um, or at least sh sh shall I say that the effect is fairly minor, and uh, I wouldn't, uh, I certainly wouldn't um, go out on a limb and, and recommend that everyone should have a high PCO2. But if you did wish to do so, uh, you really need to alter one of the other or, or more of the other parameters, which include uh, peak inspiratory pressure and um, arguably rate of rise of pressure. So by changing the inspiratory-expiratory ratio, you can change the mechanical power. But I think um, uh, the, the long view is that we need more evidence that uh, basically looking at trials, looking at low mechanical power versus higher mechanical power to see if there really is an independent effect of that on, on outcomes. Thank you. Um, so please do stand up and holler if you've got any questions. I don't think we've got any mics in the audience, but I'm happy to repeat your questions for you. Oh, there's a gentleman here with a microphone. Go ahead, sir. Hello. Hello. Can you hear? Um, thank you. Interesting um, topic and also the lectures. This question is to all three of you. Is there an outcome difference if you use TIVA versus um, kind of anesthetic gases? And is there a difference if you use opioid-free and regional anesthesia? Uh, I'll pitch that one at Mike as the evidence-based expert in this session. Uh, I can tell, say with absolute confidence that I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> um, 
there are there are a couple, three big studies coming through that, that are not focused on pulmonary complications, um, and a large well, they're generally either uh, well, one of them's cancer focused, um, one of them's recovery focused, uh, and one of them's sort of general post operative outcome focused. So uh, I'm not sure how much additional information they will pick up, which will enable us to answer this question. They are the, across the three of them, they're studying studying many thousand patients. So the Tiva volatile question will be better answered, but I suspect this aspect of it may not be. So certainly the, the vital trial of Tiva versus inhalational anesthesia literally just finished the, about a week or so ago. Um, so that won't be too long before we see that uh, in a journal. I would like to think I, it, it certainly doesn't measure PPCs as a specific outcome, but it does capture complications in other respects. So it's not the most sensitive measure, but it may give you some um, answer to that, I think. Does anybody know if Vapor C captures post operative pulmonary complications? No. No. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, uh, question in the back. Thank you, all three, for a comprehensive and enlightening talk. A uh, question for the pa for any of the three of you. Model calibration in studies of post-op pulmonary complications is often a challenge, something you allu alluded to with the discussion around proper definitions. What are some of the ways that researchers in the audience can ensure that they're capturing all of the pulmonary complication events within their data sets and properly calibrate this to understand that what they're doing is consistent with others in the literature? Ah, oh, crumbs. I, I mean, it, it's a very challenging area to measure what's going on um, because so many elements of the pulmonary complications have an element of subjectivity in their assessment. And that subjectivity can't be eliminated uh, it can only be diminished. And um, I think I, th I think we all worry as clinical trialists uh, um, about balancing the need to deliver a trial to actually get something done uh, against delivering a trial that's so insensitive to change that, that you can't really tell whether your treatment worked or not because the trial wasn't really capable of measuring change. And, and that's an ever-present issue for us, for all of us that do clinical trials. Um, and, and PPCs do have that, uh, that concern with them. The way I would strongly recommend we tackle that problem is to grade severity. So in some of the studies that we're involved with, we may measure mild, moderate, and severe uh, complications. But actually, in our analysis, we only evaluate the moderate and severe so it eliminates the subjective element by cutting out the, the milder versions. So it, it's not really a statistical control approach. It, it's, it's a more practical element of dealing with the psychology of uh, the tendency of whoever's evaluating complications to be exclusive or inclusive. Mike, I think you've got something to say. Uh, uh, it, it's a very non-technical approach to it, but I th if you take a simplistic operational approach, I think the... Uh, if you assume reasonable care, the use of, of additional oxygen, so the administration of oxygen, is, is not a bad marker. It's far from perfect, and we can all see reasons why patients ought to have it, and they haven't got it, or they are receiving it, and they, it's unnecessary. But it's, it's not a bad operational marker of whether people had lungs that were functioning as they were before they started, or whether there was, was something not happening. It's not a replacement, but it's potentially a supplement. Um. So I'm going to pick a few answers through the online system. Kate, did you want to ask your question out loud, or shall I ask it for you? Um, you've got two questions. Okay, well, um, can we have the, the mic down the, down the front here just for a moment, please? Uh, again, thank you very much for a very, uh, very good lecture. And my question is, let's say we use a supraglottic AV and endotracheal, endotracheal intubation. Uh, is there any difference no, in terms of pulmonary complications after uh, anesthesia? Supraglottic airway and endotracheal tube. I don't know. Richard, any? Uh, I, I wonder if you could repeat the question. Or, uh, Supraglottic airway versus. Uh, <laughs> oh, in, oh, difference I between uh, no, supraglottic airway 
and uh, endotical uh, intubation uh, for, let's say, the two-hour surgery, you know, in terms of pulmonary complication. Any, any, any I, difference? I don't know the answer, but of course, uh, th there would be a significant um, bias uh, for uh, just by doing a retrospective study because uh, uh, the types of surgery that you might use a supraglottic airway for are not necessarily the ones that you would use uh, endotracheal intubation. So, but the answer is I, I don't know. I, I didn't see any looking for interventions against pulmonary searching before this talk, but I didn't search for it explicitly. Thank you. Um, so uh, apologies to Professor Leslie, who, who inadvertently got a bump there. Uh, Kate, you've got a couple of questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rupert. Kate Leslie from Melbourne. I think I can probably combine them into one question. Uh, the penguin study, uh, highly relevant to this audience because it's a simple, cheap intervention of chlorhexidine mouthwash. So the, the question I have for you was that presumably is there to prevent um, the aspiration of, of bacteria and other things, and that seems to imply that that's incredibly common. Um, for all the anaesthetists in the room, how often is it that the, the trachea and, and bronchi are contaminated with, with bacteria during general anaesthesia? You've got me there, Kate. It's a while since I read that bit of the biology. Mm, pr behind. Presumably quite often. Um, certainly there is systematic review evidence and in particular evidence from cardiac surgery supporting the notion of chlorhexidin mouthwashes as being a realistic thing. There's also a lot of interest in the, their use uh, in, in the uh, critical care context. Mm. I think also there's not a lot to choose from in the resource poor context that, that we can look at and I think we, one has to be realistic that, that uh, certain things that you might use in a, in a very well-resourced hospital in, in a high-income country are just not options available in every centre around the world. And that also sort of helped the, the pragmatic choice of the interventions that we included in that trial. And so the second question is also relevant to Penguin study, but also to low-resource settings. Um, if you want to prevent pulmonary complications, should you use or not use nitrous oxide? Mike. So, um, I'm just bracketing it. I, the contributor, um, as I remember from your study, <laughs> your plural study, uh, Enigma is one of the studies that contributes to the hyperoxia story. And, and which I always struggle with a little bit because it's it's two separate interventions wrapped as one. It's um, uh, you know it's with withdrawal of nitrous oxide and hyperoxia. Um, so, do, I mean, potentially, I've, I mean, in general, I think you've shown good reason why you wouldn't use it anyway. <laughs> but uh, but yes, possibly. I guess the um, the opposite is that nitrous oxide might actually prevent. Uh, atelectasis by replacing oxygen during emergence, which is the work of Professor Payton to my left here. And it's, it's a really interesting idea that a simple thing that is used widely in low resource settings that that actually may be preventing pulmonary complications. And, and nitrogen wouldn't work? Probably just as well. Philip might be able to enlarge on that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, we need a big trial of um, of 100% oxygen on immersions versus 70 to 80% oxygen on immersions. The nitrous question is a separate one. It's 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 an interesting post hoc finding of the Enigma two trial actually, which we finally got around to doing. Um, and so I can only explain on the basis of nitrous um, uh, elimination during immersions actually counteracting the effects of absorption atelectasis by p oxygen breathing, which is standard practice on immersions. It's a very complicated issue. Sorry, I shouldn't be um, sabot um, this, this meeting. I'm not, I'm not an invited speaker at this session. So no. you're, you're very welcome, Phil. So, um, so we've got another question that's on the related topic from, from the on, through the online system, so I'm going to bring this up in into the conversation now, just asking for clarity around w what our current recommendation would be on inspired oxygen concentration during surgery. 
Uh, I've, I've already hogged the mic a little bit, so perhaps Richard and Mike, do you have thoughts on what our current recommendation on FIA2 should be as a blanket before anything goes wrong? So, leaving aside the periods immediate around intubation and emergence, which are a little bit more complicated because of the, the risk of an acute catastrophe, uh, I'm, I'm not convinced by the 80% is beneficial story, um, even necessarily for um, surgical site infection, but not overall. Um, I don't know where they're going the other extreme, and 30% is likely to definitely be better. So, so you're probably not doing a terrible thing doing what most people do most of the time, which is about 50%. There the, the may be... I, th I mean, I think we'll know. I think there are big trials coming that will uh, inform us better, but I think at the moment we don't know with confidence. But I'm, I, I don't think the surgical site infection story is uh, upheld by the literature. Yeah, just to add to that, at, at the time of emergence, there's no question that using very high FiO2 increases the risk of atelectasis. The question that hasn't been answered, in my opinion, is that is whether the atelectasis that you get is indeed harmful. There's plenty of reasons why it might be, but I'm not sure we know for sure. Thank you. So um, we're just nearing the end of the session time now, so I'm just going to throw one final question to my two panel colleagues here. Um, I'm an, an ICU doctor. I haven't uh, given anaesthetic for a long time now, so I don't know why I'm sitting here. But anyway, uh, um, I think the big learning in ARDS, in critical care, over the last 25 years is that we were causing most of it. So when we started introducing low tidal volume ventilation uh, into routine patient care in the ICU, the nature of ARDS transformed completely. There used to be a time that I can remember when we were routinely sticking four or five chest drains into patients and several patients in our ICU at the same time, often CT guided. And as soon as we adopted a routine low tidal volume approach, the, the need to do that kind of thing almost vanished overnight. So it wasn't so much ARDS as ventilator-induced lung injury, or to put it a different way, harm that we caused. So how much do you think of the harm that we're talking about today in this session is harm that we cause, and how much of it's relating to the biology that the patient has when we meet them? I think most of it is harm that we cause. It's, the, it's all, all the st stuff that we do as part of the anaesthetic, and then everything that the surgeon does, and you add it all together. And that, that, that you just hope, or hope we, we should be doing better than hope, but the balance of those two things, that the, whatever the aim of the surgery is, outweighs that, that harm, which is not always the case. I, I would say, I mean, I agree with you, Intensive care in the 90s was very different, lots of chest drains. I think we may underestimate, so we both changed tidal volume, but I think fluid management changed a lot over that period as well, so we became much drier, uh, which again is something you can overdo. Uh, and uh, I mean, re relief, you know, perioperative study of, of uh, being cautious but not too cautious, I think is a useful indicator in this setting rather than the critical care setting. So, so too much fluid, clearly harmful, but, but not enough. Also, also potentially <laughs> um, I, uh, Richard doesn't like that answer, so he's going to speak next. <laughs> my, my apologies. I, I didn't mean to disconnect the microphone. But I, I agree, uh, Mike. Almost everything that we do uh, intraoperatively or in the ICU is non-physiologic. Uh, we use monotonous tidal volumes, uh, whereas the uh, distribution of tidal volumes and, and interbreath interval are, in fact, fractal. And there's some evidence from animal studies that uh, by replicating a fractal pattern actually improves uh, pulmonary function. Thank you. So uh, I think it's time to draw the session to a close. I think the thing I would summarize about th those two answers is if we're going to find ways to prevent pulmonary complications, we've got to start looking at the treatments we ourselves give and changing them the way we give them. And we need to be prepared to do that within clinical trials to find the way forwards. So uh, I think a, a lot of this area of research is plagued by arguments about what the right thing to do is. And if we can't come up with some form of agreement that allows us to test things in a clinical trial, we're never going to find the way forwards. So uh, I think that's a really important consideration. I'd like to really thank you as an audience, my co-speakers, and uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the opening ceremony. Thank you. <laughs>